Hey everyone, welcome. Today we're going to talk about some things that obscure our vision of reality, some things that keep us from seeing the truth about life. And so I just kind of made a list of some things this morning, and these are the things that we're going to focus on. Um, welcome to Dragon and Dat Sweat and whoever else may join. I'm glad you're here. Um, so some of the things that obscure our view of reality are the things that are grotesque or tragic, um, death, God's seeming absence, um, his seeming displeasure, um, money and the mundane. So those are the things that I'm sure there's more, but those are the things that came to my mind when I was thinking about what really causes us to live in an unrealistic view of the world. So the first thing that I want to talk about is how the grotesque, the really awful things that happen obscure our view of reality. So, you know, these could be things that happen to us personally, personal tragedy, um, and or it could be things that we just observe from a distance, terrible things that happen in the world. Like I'm seeing pictures of people who are starving in Yemen. And so when you see the awful and grotesque things that are happening in the world, it can be really hard to hold a picture of God as good and loving and beautiful and perfect. These things don't seem to match up with our reality. This God who is so powerful, who created all things and, and who loves us. And yet if God is so good and powerful, then why do we see images of people starving in various places around the world, horrible disasters and tragedies that happen, and even sometimes personal tragedies. I'm thinking of a friend who recently lost her leg in an accident. And so these personal tragedies and these just experiencing the, the things that we see in this corrupt world can cause us to have just a wrong view of God and to not see the true picture of who he is. Well, um, hi, welcome to Mosin, Honesty Angel, Nightmare. Glad you guys are here. Thanks for being here. So how do we deal with that? How do we hold a picture of God as beautiful and loving and perfect and good when these horrible things are happening in the world? Well, the, the first thing we have to understand is that God is not the God of this world. And that may scare some Christians when I say that, but what I'm saying is coming straight from the Bible. You know, it, in, in John 14, Jesus says, the ruler of this world he, he talks about Satan as the ruler of this world. In 2 Corinthians, Satan or the devil is talked about as the God of this world. 1 John says the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. John 16, 11 says the ruler of this world now stands condemned. Hebrews it, Chapter two talks about the power of the of death being in the hands of the devil. So we have to understand that the ruler of this world is actually not our good and beautiful creator God. The ruler of this world and its system is Satan. Well, how did Satan get to be the ruler of this world? Did God give him that power? Well, that is not the way that the Bible describes it. Actually, God gave humanity rule over this world. God gave humanity, um, he made us the governors of this world. So how did Satan 
get so much power? How is he now called the ruler of this world? Well, his authority doesn't come from himself. It's given to him by human beings. So when human being it's when human beings are deceived by Satan, he gets power. He works, he works through human beings uh, to bring tragedy and corruption and horrible things that we see in this world. And so that is why the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. So, but nice little trick he tries to pull, which is to whisper in your ear, you see, he causes the death and destruction and tragedy. And then he says, where is your God? If your God is so good, why doesn't he stop this? Well, God has, he has power and he does want to use his power to intervene in this world. But God doesn't just insert himself wherever he wants. He has given human beings the power in this world. So he works through us. And that's why prayer is so important. Because when we're praying, we're asking God to intervene in this world. For God to, to use his power to work. And so God... He, God does work in this world and he works through human beings who are submitted to his will and human beings who ask him to work in this world. But when we see the horrible things, the grotesque and the awful things that happen in this world, we should not attribute those to our good and beautiful God. God is not responsible for those tragedies. God is not responsible for the way that the world looks right now. Actually, it is human beings who are responsible for the way the world works right now and the way it looks and the corruption within it. But God is so good and so beautiful and so perfect that even when we messed up this world, even though we've made this world a place where people starve, even though we've made this world a place where there's violence and hatred and every other awful thing, God still loves us so much that he made a rescue plan. And he has done that in the in a very beautiful way. He let Jesus, Jesus came into the world, God in the flesh came in the world to heal us and rescue us and save us. And so there is salvation from all the tragedy that happens in this world. And that salvation comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, anyone who believes in me will have eternal life. And that eternal life isn't just in this faraway place called heaven. No, eternal life starts here and now. God's kingdom, who God is, comes and, and changes your life and helps you make the world a better place right now. God, uh, You can be part of helping God's kingdom reign on this earth. You can be part of of letting the things of the good and beautiful and loving God come here and now. And you do that by trusting in our Savior, Jesus Christ, our, our rescuer who has saved us from the power of the corruption, the power of the awful things that, are, that, that we've done, and, and from the power of death. So um, this is what... Um, this is how we get back to the reality of, of, of when we see the evil things that are happening in this world. We don't attribute those to God and, and his kingdom. No, those are the things of this world. And, you know, sometimes we have a false idea of what this world should be. The Bible is really clear that this world is a war zone. Um, and that we we can't expect, um, you know, this world to be 
uh, perfect. There's we're we're wrestling against the powers of darkness. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter five. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. This doesn't say you're going to live happily ever after in the here and now. No, it says make the most of your time right now because the days are evil and you don't know when evil is going to come against you. So make the most of what God has given you today. Look what it says as we go on in, in um, Ephesians chapter 6. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. So you cannot expect this world that Satan is the ruler of to suddenly become this wonderful place for you where nothing bad ever happens. Like it or not, you are part of a cosmic battle. You're part of a war. You are, and and you've got to choose a side and you've got to fight. And so, and I hope no one thinks I'm talking about a physical war where people shoot each other with guns. I am not talking about that at all. The Bible says that our weapons are not physical in nature. They are spiritual for demolishing strongholds and everything that stands against the knowledge of our God. So our weapons are spiritual. We are in a battle and, and what you do and what you think is important. And so be ready to stand when the evil day comes. Be ready to stand when you see images of horrible tragedies that are happening in the world. Be ready to stand and realize that this world is not a place where God rules, but it will one day be a place as the kingdom of our God spreads throughout the earth. So um, for the time being, we we fight and we realize that evil does sometimes have its power and its day. And, you know, even Jesus, you know, some people would say, well, you know, that's not really fair for God to just, you know, watch from above as we deal with all this suffering and death and everything that happens. Well, Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh. God entered into our suffering. He didn't stand apathetic to our suffering. He entered this place and he experienced the grotesque. He experienced torture. He experienced a bloody death on a cross. So he is worthy of our trust. He didn't stand back and watch us suffer. He entered into this place and he is our exact representation of who God is. Um, so, you know, the, the second thing, and this is kind of wrapped up with the grotesque and awful things that happen, but death, death, death can obscure our view of reality because death is it, when it, when it hits us, whether through a family member or a friend or just in, in a less personal way, but we, we all experience death in some way. And, and when, when the reality of death hits us, that can really obscure our view of what is true. And the truth is that death has no power over us now. Death is not the end of the story. I've talked to so many people who like they were believers in God and then they like stopped believing because like God didn't answer their prayer to heal their sick grandmother. And that really surprises me because um, how did you expect that your grandmother was going to live forever? We, we all, you know, face that, I mean, in, in her mortal body, because God has given us immortality through Jesus Christ, but we all live in a mortal body. So when death comes, 
this is something that should be expected. This is not something that should cause us to turn away from the living God. And unfortunately, some people do. You know, I, I would hate to experience a horrible tragedy like the death of a child. Um, but, you know, I have Christian friends who experienced the death of a child, but who remained faithful to God because they know the truth that death of our mortal bodies is a reality. But God has promised us something greater, and that is what's real. The, the truth is that death is not the end. And I want to read something that Jesus said to people who were thinking that death was the end. Um, when the Sadducees approached Jesus, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And they were trying to test Jesus. And so they asked him a question about you know, uh, the resurrection from the dead. And they were trying to trick him. And Jesus said, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. So for those who don't believe in life after death, Jesus says, you are badly mistaken. Badly mistaken. Death does not have the final say for humanity. God has promised a resurrection from the dead and eternal life in his kingdom. So that is the hope that we hold on to, even when we experience casualties of war, casualties that happen in this present world that is ruled by the evil one. So um, the next, um, and you know, one of the th things even that can just drag me down sometimes, like if I'm driving on the road and I'll see like a dead deer on the side of the road with like bloody, you know, like a bloody stump and like, you know, just somehow just the guts of the deer and it's just a terrible picture. You know, that just brings me to an, an awful place place of experiencing what is it is it is reality but it's a distorted view of reality because i'm only seeing one part of the picture i'm only seeing the tragic death of that animal but i'm not seeing the full picture that jesus talks about jesus said that hey not even one sparrow you know a a, a sparrow isn't worth that much to humanity. But Jesus said that not even one sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father. So our Father, our loving God, is aware of all the tragic deaths of every animal. Not even a sparrow dies without our God taking notice of it. And God has a plan to bring all of creation to restoration in his kingdom. You know, the, the Bible talks about animals being in God's kingdom. It says that one day the lion will lay down with the lamb. And so there's imagery of, of even the animals being restored. So um, we can't let the images that bombard our mind, if just an animal dead on the side of the road, don't let that be your reality because what is real and true is so much bigger than that image that you're experiencing, which is real. It's not that it isn't real, but it gives you a distorted view of reality if that's all you see. 
Um, so, uh, and guys, thank you for your comments that you're putting into um, uh, the, the chat. And I will put up some of your comments in a bit. I want to say like everything that's on my mind to say, and then I'll respond to questions and, I, and I'll put up your comments. And I may even let people join the stream if you want to come on and say anything. So welcome, Mind Ben and Nicholas, Proclaimer of the Messiah. Glad you're here. Um, okay, so um, the the other thing that can obscure our view of reality is feeling like God is absent. You know, when we look around at the world, we don't see God present with us. And sometimes we don't feel God present. Now, sometimes I do feel God present and I love those times and I wish I could feel God present with me at all times. And I wish that I had an unending um, a sensation of his love for me at all times. And there are some people who have that. You know, my, my husband says he feels God's love for him at all times. I don't always feel God's love for me. I don't always um, experience him as being present in the moment with me. And there's many people who never feel like God is present with them. But we cannot let our feeling in the moment determine what reality is. God is present. He is real. And his disposition toward us is one as a friend. Think about Jesus and how he treated his friends. You know, his friends weren't always that good to him. They kind of you know, they, they betrayed him. They, they weren't always like thinking right or acting right. And, but Jesus never wavered in his love or in his disposition toward them. And, you know, I have a friend that's really struggling with a sin right now. And she has been, you know, regularly talking to me and confessing this sin and, you know, talking about her struggle. And, and so, you know, and then I try to help her and share the truth with her. And the, the other day she said, well, I just really want to stop this sin because I know it, how much it's hurting my relationship with God. I just, and, you know, I, I, and it was making her feel like she was not being accepted by God because of this sin. And so then I was like, well, you know, when you express this sin to me, when you tell me about it, do I reject you? And she said, no. I said, does it seem like I love you less because of your sin? She said, no. And I was like, well, if I don't love you less, if I don't reject you, then how much better of a friend is Jesus? How much better is God than I am? I'm an imperfect, corrupt human being, but I don't reject you. And my love for you doesn't change just because you are struggling with this sin and having trouble overcoming it. What am I doing? I'm here trying to support you and, and, encourage you and help you and pray for you and get you to, you know, be able to overcome. And that is the way the Lord is dealing with you. When you're stuck in a sin, when you're having trouble overcoming something, when you're frustrated with yourself because you want to do right, but then you find yourself still doing evil and you want to stop, but you're weak. Well, what is God's disposition toward you? It's at one as a friend, an encourager, one who wants to see you overcome. God is not rejecting you. God is embracing you. He's actually drawing you closer. You know, I talk to this friend more now because of what she's struggling with. I'm talking to her more because I'm, I want to be there for her. And so... God is like that. God draws us close to him when we're in a struggle. God's fighting for us. He's the friend that sticks by your side when no one else will. Did you know even 
if you're, there are actions that you can do right now that will cause people to reject you. There are, there are things that people have done that have caused their family to abandon them, their friends to abandon them. And, but you know what? Even when your friends and family abandon you, God will never do that. He will draw you close to himself. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He's a good friend. He's a true friend. And he is there rooting for you, trying to give you victory over the darkness. So um, don't let Satan get the double whammy on you where he tempts you to do something, you fall into temptation, you're weak, you sin, and then he makes you feel guilty and makes you feel like God doesn't love you. Well, that's a lie. God is with you. God will help you. God will give you strength. So, um, you know, even when it feels like God is absent, just think about the reality of this world. Why do we exist? Why does the sky exist? Why does the earth exist? Why do humans and animals and plants and all these things exist? It's because God is real. He is real. Even though you can't physically see him with your eyes, he is the reality. And the reality is he is always with you. And his love is greater than anything, any kind of love that you've experienced in this world. Um, his, you know, the, the Bible says in the prayer that Paul prays in Ephesians is, I just pray that you would know how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge. This is a love that there's nothing like it in this world. God's love for us, there's there's nothing like it. But some of us have tasted a little bit of it. And if you've tasted a little bit of it, you always want more. Um, and so, and some haven't tasted of that. But even if you haven't tasted or experienced God's love, doesn't mean it isn't true. It is true. There is a God in heaven. He loves you. He's with you. And he is the invisible God. He is the immortal God. But invisible does not mean absent. He is present. He is very present with you. He sticks closer than a brother. Um, so then the, the other thing that's part of that is, you know, if we start thinking that God is displeased with us or that you know, we can, we, that's part of forgetting who you are, forgetting what God has made us to be. Look at what first John says about it. First John chapter three says, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We are children of God. You know, not everyone, and there may be somebody watching this who is not a child of God. Because there are people that Jesus even said they were children of the devil. You know, the, the Pharisees said, hey, we're children of Abraham. And Jesus said, hm, you're, if, if, if you knew, if you were Abraham's child, you would love me. But you, um, I'm, I'm probably butchering this, but he said, you're, you're basically a child of the devil. You're not children of Abraham. So um, there, there are people who are not children of God, who are not, have not accepted and, and, been adopted by God into his family. God wants everyone to be his child. God wants everyone in his family, but he doesn't force you into it. That is something that you have to decide. You have to decide, do you want to be part of God's family? You've got to, and it's so easy. It's God has made it easy to welcome you 
into his family and you are welcome. It doesn't matter what you've said, what you've done. The Lord now says you can turn from that old life. You can turn and become my child. And so the Lord welcomes you to become his child. And if you are a child of God, don't forget that's what you are. You have an inheritance from God. You have been actually, you're a brother and sister of Jesus Christ. You inherit with him. Jesus said to his father, Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am. I want to, I'm giving them the glory that you gave me. Jesus is sharing his inheritance. You know, Jesus is, he is the inheritor of all things. He is the, the Lord and he is willing to share his inheritance with you. That's, that's a good friend. That's your brother. That is your brother who loves you. So um, let's go on to the next thing that can obscure our view of reality. Money. You know, money can be quite deceptive. We get caught up in thinking that money is real. And what I mean by that is we think, oh, you know, so-and-so overcharged me. I got overcharged a hundred dollars and now I'm so mad and I've got it. And we get caught up in dealing with the things of this world and with money as if money is um, the ultimate reality, as if we need it for life. And I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not saying that, you know, money isn't real in the way that you go to the store and you buy things with money. Absolutely. And I'm not giving anyone permission to not pay your bills, you know, but this is so pay your bills because you have an obligation, but recognize that the money that you have right now, it's actually closer to being like monopoly money. You know, when you play monopoly or some kind of game that has money, you know, when you get into the game, you're like, I want my money. And it starts feeling very real. And, you know, you can get into this. Yeah, I'm getting money from rent. I'm getting money from this. And, and you know, so you're playing the game, but in the game, you actually care about what happens with that fake money that you're holding. That money is has no real power in the real world, right? But but in the game, it feels like it does. Well, the, the money that we deal with in this world is actually more like monopoly money than maybe we give it credit for. You know, look what Jesus says um, about money. He, he, he was talking about like Jesus tells this parable of the shrewd manager who like was about to get fired. And so he started like giving away, um, you know, canceling the debts of the people who you know, owed his master money. And uh, Jesus said, look, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with real true riches? So Jesus is saying that the wealth of this world, that's not the true riches. Actually, there are true riches and those true riches come from God. But you've been given responsibility with monopoly money. You've been given responsibility with money that isn't going to last. And look what Jesus says. He says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed, welcomed into eternal dwellings. Use your worldly wealth to make friends. No, it's not going to matter if someone cheated you out of $100. It's not going to matter if they cheated you out of $1,000. When someone cheats you out of money, don't don't credit it against them. Think of it as that is cancel their debt. Cancel their debt. That's what God wants you to do. Cancel their debt. Don't worry about what someone owes you. 
Now, if you have an obligation to someone else, pay it because that's right. But don't get caught up in holding on to your worldly wealth. Use your worldly wealth to make friends. Don't be afraid to give away your money. Don't be afraid to give away what you have that Jesus said is not the true riches. So Jesus commended this manager who gave away his master's money. Okay. Now, some people think that's strange because Jesus is, this guy's actually kind of cheating, right? Like he's giving away his master's money, not his own money. And Jesus is commending him for it. Well, what do you have that God has not given to you? All of what you have right now is actually your master's money. So give away your master's money to make friends and, and be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Don't try to hold on to this world's wealth. You know, if you're, and again, I'm not saying people shouldn't balance, you know, their, their account and take care of their obligations, take care of your obligations, but don't hold on and hoard your money. That's unwise. Be wise with your money. Use it for good purposes. Use it to help people. Use it for the purposes of God's kingdom um, because you can't take it with you. You know, you can, you can gather up all the money in the world and it's not going to help you. And it's not true riches. If I win a Monopoly game, what does it actually matter? It doesn't matter. Well, this world's money is like that. It doesn't matter how much you hoard up. It's going to do you no good in the real, in real life reality, the reality of God's kingdom. So um, <laughs> Zeng says, give away people's money as long as it's not your own. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, it, it's God's Zeng. Um, so I'm not telling anyone that they should cheat other people or take their money. Um, now, I, I'm there's some really good comments here, and I'm going to put them up. Um, but I want to get I want to go through one last thing that I think obscures us to reality, and then I will look through the comments, put some up, and I will also invite anybody watching. You can come on the stream, Zing. I'd love to have you come on the stream and share your um, thoughts about this and anyone else too. So um, we'll do that in just a minute, but I want to go over the last thing that kind of obscures reality and it's the mundane, you know, the things that are just make life so mundane, like getting a flat tire, you know, you can be having a great time with God. And then all of a sudden you get a flat tire and it's like, Oh, why do I have to deal with this? Or just the, the daily routine of life, waking up to an alarm, going to work, doing, you know, work tasks that don't feel like they're important. Um, don't get caught up in the mundane. Remember that everything that you do has purpose. There, the, the mundane is a lie. It's a lie. It's not reality. You're part of an epic story. That's the truth. You're part of an epic story and everything you do matters. Everything you do matters. So, you know, sometimes I, I, this might sound a little strange, but sometimes I watch a fantasy movie just so I can get back to reality because sometimes the mundane things of the world can become reality. Sometimes I need to remember that the reality is so much greater than that, that it's actually, you know, we, we watch these fantasy movies and we call it fantasy, but it's actually much closer to reality. You know, the reality is that this is a grand story. This is a grand creation. You're spinning on a giant globe right now. You are you know, there's galaxies swirling, there's, you know, stars burning, and 
and every little thing, all the little creatures under the ground and everything. This is an amazing story. And there's things that are unseen. There are angels. There are demons. There's a battle going on. Everything that we love about a good movie, you know, uh, it, a, a good love movie has an ad, uh, a love. A good movie has adventure, and and all of these things are true about our reality. This is we we're in a battle, but we're also on an adventure. And the end of this story is good. And even if we experience terrible things in this world, there is a good ending to this story. Sometimes we can get bogged down. And even in a movie, you can get bogged down, you know, and, and to the place where the, the hero, it seems like there's no way that the hero can overcome. But in the end, he does or she does. And that is what it's like with the story that we are in. We already know the end of the story. The end of the story is good. And so whatever you're going through right now, you should know that the end of the story is good. And this is a story worth being part of. As mundane as your daily life can seem, find a way to break through the, the routine of life and see reality for what it is. Know that there are angels around you. There are the, the, the angels and God, they're pulling for you. They're, they're with you. They're, they're wanting the best for you. And, and so look at what uh, it says in, in Romans chapter eight, it says in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this is our reality, guys. It is full of God's amazing love and it has a good ending to the story. So, um, just wanted to encourage you guys with those things. And now I will just put the link in here if anybody wants to join. And while I'm waiting, I will um, put up some of these good comments here. So uh, let's see. Andrew Cummings says, love greater than knowledge. Did I hear that right? You know, the I don't know if it's love greater than knowledge. Did I say that? I think I was like quoting from the Bible, but I might have misquoted it. Let's let me just read from it. It says to know this love. Oh, yeah, it does say that to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And I don't know exactly what that means, Andrew. Do you? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, Nicholas, proclaimer of the Messiah, says, children of Abraham are those of the faith. Yes, exactly. Amen. Um, so let's see. Uh, money is not real. It is an illusion we all agree upon. Yes, it's true. Very good. All right. Nicholas, proclaimer of the Messiah is here. I'm so happy that you're here. Do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. I was struggling to mute the YouTube here. Hello. It's good to meet Hi. you. Hi. <laughs> and, um, oh, yeah, I think I, I got distracted trying to do mute, but I think I had um, a response to what you were just saying about, um, oh, what does it mean that it surpasses knowledge? I think in that context, it um, surpasses any knowledge we could have um so it surpasses any love that we could actually know so i don't i don't think it's um drawing a contrast between the value of love and knowledge right cool good I, i'm good way of expressing that now air review says keep your treasure in heaven where moth and rust and thieves cannot steal it yes 
Exactly. Thank you. And let's see, you put up another one, Nicholas. So um, you said, I don't recall Jesus speaking of a master's money being given away. I recall when Jesus spoke of a master's money being invested unto profit. You want to talk about what you meant by that? Yeah, as far as I recall, um, and it looked that way when I tried to look up online, the parable of the talents um, is when the first two invest and the last one is in, afraid to invest. And I, I just think um, investment with expectation of profit is not quite um, synonymous with giving. So I don't know if there's another parable I'm forgetting or if um, we don't yes. quite agree maybe. I was referring to the parable of the shrewd manager, which is, you okay. know. Less well known maybe, so I'm not remembering it. Okay, so it, um, it's, you know, there's a manager of, you know, his, of a, a rich man's possessions. And I'll just read it. It says the manager, okay, so um, the man, the, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot manage any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose, when I lose my job here, people will, will, will welcome me into their, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. So it's kind of an odd parable, and that's in Luke chapter 16. It's kind of an odd parable because, you know, you've got like this, dis, what the manager's doing is actually dishonest, right? He's giving away his master's money, and yet he is the hero of Jesus's parable. So, um, but I think what Jesus is trying to say there is use what, what you have in your power, like it's actually your master's money. Yeah, I mean, but, he, he keeps he, going there, and it, it's kind yeah. of mysterious still. I'm, I'm reading forward. I, th I think we should continue forward because he's not done exp um, expounding, might be the word. I don't know, um, yeah. explaining what he's talking about. Yeah, let's keep going. I And this is the part I read when I was talking. Hi, Andrew. Welcome. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I'm doing all right. Hello, Andrew. Hey, Nicholas. Cool. Um, I will finish reading this and then I'm, we'll hear from Andrew. But so then Jesus says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, yeah. And um, I think this word mammon is um, avarice. So it means... Um, it vaguely refers to greediness, but it means self-interest overall, I think. And um, I'm going to have to definitely contemplate this because I think there is um, a deep spiritual point here. So I'm just going to have to come back to this later. Cool. Well, welcome, mine, Ben, and Joseph Smith, a a a.k.a. Nathan. Um, and so Andrew jumped on here. Andrew, was there um, something you wanted to say? Uh, I, I, I guess I can wait. I was just here because I haven't been on the channel very much. And I guess if, if we do ever 
um, I, I guess I'm more into the the science aspects of, of reality, but um, that's kind of where my worldview centers around. Um, oh, cool. So so if, if you want to talk about that, I can stay around, but uh, otherwise I don't have much on the, the theological side of things. Okay, cool. Well, I mean, you're welcome to stick around and we can talk about, you know, whatever, wherever the conversation leads with regard sure. to experiencing reality. So I'm open to talking about the scientific nature of reality. Um, what about mind Ben and Joseph Smith? What do you guys want to say about this discussion? I'm not sure what we've been talking about. I was just, I was watching SJ's stream where she was talking about different manuscripts and translations, but it was one of the more painful experiences I've had in my life. It was almost as painful as the Standing for Truth interview when there was nothing I could do. <laughs> well, I told you, Nathan, I would. we can have our own conversation about that, and you can tell me all the reasons, you know, why that was wrong. So, um, okay, well, we've been talking about, like, uh, reality, like what is true and like getting past some of the things that like obscure our view of reality. And, you know, just some of the things that I brought up were like, the, like grotesque things, like terrible things that happen, death, um, you know, things that obscure our vision of who God is and, and like his disposition toward us. Um, money was like a big one that we've been talking about, like, you know, how kind of like the money that we use in this world is, it's actually more like monopoly money. You know, it's Jesus said, like, if you haven't been trusted with worldly wealth, like who will trust you with true riches? And so there is something, there are true riches and the money that we use in this world is we should be using it for um, doing good. And, you know, but we shouldn't like hold on to it as if it's like the reality and, you know, I don't know, like we shouldn't trust in it. Um, and then we also, t I, we, I was also talking about how the mundane, like mundane things in life obscure us to the reality that we're part of an epic story and like everything that we do is important. Mine bin. Hi. Um, hello. Is my uh, mic working? Yeah, you're fine. Uh, all right. Um, um, I, I guess I, um, don't have, um, um, I don't have any direct comments, um, on what was being talked about earlier, like with the yeah. parable, um, and, um, so on. Um, but, I kind of just came on here um, in the hopes of getting on some kind of discussion. <laughs> um, so I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, maybe I'll say something later, but um, I, I guess I don't really have any other comments right now. And um, okay. I don't, I don't think we've had a chance to meet voice to voice before, mine, Ben. So um, it's good to yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's here. good to hear you, um, Nicholas. Um, Okay, so if I guess we can we can go with what a rational empiricist would like to say about reality. Uh, sure. Um, so so I guess in the perspective of of biases, um, both inherent to us and inherent in our culture, influencing how we perceive reality. Um, to to me, this is where the 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 nature of uh, having other people kind of check your work, basically, and um, and 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 re repeating what you're doing. Of course, this is again getting into the 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 worldview I focus on in terms of the scientific enterprise. Um, but but what what are your initial thoughts on how? in in some ways we cannot judge what is um 
I, I don't want to say absolutely true because absolute true philosophically is kind of a, a deep rabbit hole. Um, but in, in terms of what is true, how do you think about the idea that in order to perceive what is true, you need to kind of have different perspectives on it in terms of other people? I guess. I don't know if that made sense at all. What... I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I think like people can have perspectives. Some of them are right and some of them are wrong. So, I mean, how do we discover what is reality? And that's something everybody kind of has to decide how they're going to view the world through what filter are they going to view the world and how are they going to decide what is real and true? So, Right. Well, well, I mean, the, the perspective I was taking on this was basically, since like you said, we all have uh, kind of our own filters on certain things and not others. Um, it's good to have other people weigh in and sometimes correct yourself, um, at least in terms of science, how you, you, you need to repeat experiments, for example, otherwise there's no... Um, there's 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 no objective way of determining what is true or not because if one person says one thing and another person says another thing how do you determine what is true if unless other people kind of weigh in and say oh person a is is more likely to be correct because uh more and more people are, are kind of siding with him i guess well, if I may respond, sure. the fear of Yehovah is the beginning of wisdom. And so that's the first step is to fear God. And um, that also correlates with a very deep self-honesty. And the only avenue to become that self-honest person who fears God to begin wisdom is trust in the person, Jesus Christ, who made God obvious through what he has done in history. So um, and do, we, we do, we do like, use review amongst brothers and the Holy Spirit is given to us. So I think actually that's the pinpoint answer is that the spirit of what is true, the spirit of truth, the spirit of God um, indwells us. And that's the main person we go to for that feedback that you're talking about, you know, and then he indwells our brothers also and sisters, but um, we're, we're given different levels of responsibility in the body according to that but so we go to our trustworthy brothers and sisters also and they're a part of providing that that spirit is provided through them as well so it always comes down to the spirit of the truth the spirit of god um, that's actually the key need the key need is not other people though the spirit of truth chooses to dwell in people. So so you're talking about revelation basically as the essential factor. Well, no, no, the spirit of truth is uh, much more in everything, you know? So science is a discipline to try to submit to the spirit of truth without letting the individual person's biases get in the way. Right. So um, yeah, you, you're, um, we don't wanna turn the spirit of truth into a mere like, uh, we just want to be clear that the truth of reality is the spirit of God. There is no difference between the two things. Okay. Nathan, what's your answer? I mean, I'm just trying to think of what the, the best thing to say is like, I, I have some different opinions, but I'm not sure how productive it would be to put them forward. I think I think maybe so. So I'll restrain the ideas I've got, and I, I guess I've got a question: Is so for someone who um, doesn't accept that God exists, for example, do you think that to say, well, um, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, would be like a a good answer to help them form more true beliefs or something like one? Because surely part of um, trying to convince someone of like a definition of truth or something is going to involve is going to involve convincing them and you're going to want to you know the proposition you want to convince them of 
is that it's true that God exists, right? But then if they say, well, what's our kind of standard for truth? And you say, well, it, you know, we've got to start with fear of God to the, the um, beginning of wisdom. Then they're going to be like, well, that's a problem because I'm not already committed to that. Um, right. I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to, I, I don't know if this is like the type of discussion that you want to have right now, like on it, but yeah, why I mean, not? that was what I was thinking to some of the things that were said. Cool. I think I, I probably already changed the topic anyways, so. No, no, no. This is this is absolutely within the topic. We're 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 figuring out reality. And so I would like to hear what Nicholas would respond to what Nathan said. Yeah, and um Yeah, I think it is good to just honestly express our disagreement. So I'm not much for like debate and burden of proof all the time necessarily. I like to begin by expressing um, myself without that burden. But um, yeah, the if one believes there is a reality or there is a truth, then one believes there is a God. It's a category error to um, say that one does not believe in a God, but one does believe that there is reality or truth. And then that's what I Romans 1 says that everyone knows there is a God. Um, that's just, a ma it's an undeniable matter of logic unless you make a category error or a definitional error. Could so I... what, what is it about the word reality that means the same thing as God then? And that, I mean, also, if reality means the same thing as God, then isn't that going to be a form of pantheism or panentheism as well? And also true, I mean, like w William Lane Craig, for example, right, would, would say he's a deflationary theorist about truth. Um, truth is just whatever is the case. So if, um, you know, I've got a cardboard box in my hand, then I say I've got a cardboard box in my hand. It's true just in case I do have a cardboard box in my hand. Um, is John guilty of the crime? Well, it's true just in case John is guilty of the crime. It's false in case he isn't. There's nothing over and above you know, those particular states of affairs that make them true or false. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, yeah, the, the first thing was, you, so you said two different words, right? Reality and truth and tale that um, God exists. Now, are you offering some argument there and saying that um, God is a necessary condition for them to exist? Because then there's a story to be told, right? And some further reasons to be given. Um, or are you saying that, that they're just equivalent? It means the same thing because then, if I don't kind of like how are there reasons for that or do I just have to share some kind of intuition that you have or something? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's a lot to be unpacked in, in what you said. Well, um, I am saying that if one believes that there is reality, then they believe there is a God. Um, but the true God is not synonymous with the created universe or anything like that. It's just um, in order to claim that there is nothing in that God place, what the word God means, one has to claim that there's no truth and no reality. Once you claim a truth and a reality, then that God category um, has something in it. So the, um, that's just a matter of what category the word God is is in context you know what does it mean when you say though that like if someone like admits that there's a reality then there's a god like can you explain what you mean by that um i can't explain it but i can read a bit of romans one mm -hmm. where god explains it so let me see. Um... I think the the problem with Romans one twenty right is that it's going to be to literally just assert the very thing that's in question here. But for the person who isn't already committed to the assertion of God, um, telling them that they already believe it when they're if they're quite convinced that you know they don't, isn't going to be a good reason for them to like adopt the conclusion that you're offering. You want to sort of try and offer people reasons that they're already committed to. And oh, um, well, I, I 
I have, you see, the only way to save people is with the shepherd's voice. His sheep hear his voice and don't follow another voice. So if I say what a dead person or a goat will relate to, then I might draw them, but I'm not drawing them to salvation. And the sheep aren't going to follow that voice because it's not his voice. And so, um, yeah, it, it's... Um, But I, I don't, um, there, there's more to it than just that it's an empty assertion because the word of God is reliable. That's kind of a big topic. But just to explain but, my but answer to the question, like, like, like I said, I'm not, I'm not necessarily as much for debate as each person honestly sharing their perspective. And because, mm -hmm. you know, um, people can like um, respond to truth or not. But I don't try to like manipulate whether or not people respond by making a case that appeals to them. That's just not something I do. Mm -hmm. But I would just like to read this as an answer to the question, not to try to mm -hmm. argue that people should agree. So it says here, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness um, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known from God is obvious in them because God has shown unto them because the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made his eternal power and Godship. Yeah. And his Godship, his Godness <laughs> so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, but became void in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Yeah, so that's the problem, is it is obvious in you. And so um, I don't have any better I argument. You weren't offering an argument, though. Hang on. So you can't, I, I, I can't let you get away with that, because... So the thing you said when well, you well, I was saying I wasn't right. intending to, but I'm willing to converse. Well, I wasn't well, trying to be stubborn either. When you began that, right? I like I'm I'm not bothered about being wrong myself. I mean, I'd be happy to become a, a Muslim right now. I'd be happy to become a Catholic, to become a Calvinist. Uh, like I'm I'm happy just following wherever my reason leads me because I care about what's true. So I'm not um I'm not trying to I, I'm not entrenched in my views. I'm not trying to like battle you or anything like that. But I, but I am willing to push back on like bad points because I think that's the only way we can kind of come to truth is by following oh, oh, yeah. like, well, the norms get... of rational discourse. So, well, yeah, so then... Rather oh, than debating, I, I, I may real quick, yeah, please, because um, yeah, when I said the argument is, I didn't mean to say I'm switching to now. I want to argue. I was just expressing that there is an argument that we're reading in the text. So um, I was just being honest, and there honestly is an argument in the text, and it responds to what you were saying. So, um, and so why the, don't so Jason, point, wait, and Nathan, why don't, how about instead of like we having, we're, us having like an argument about it, I would like to hear from you where you would start. Like, how would you, like, what would you do? What would be different about your approach than Nicholas's approach? Yeah, I think I would want to, um, just exp I'd want to engage firstly I'd want to deploy like the norms of rational discourse right so I think I think in any discourse about any point it's a really bad move to just assert your conclusion as part of the premises that you're trying to like reason someone to so if for example if you're like um, I don't know uh, trying to convince someone why they should vote for a particular political party let's call them um like the shoe party or something and then they say well why do you think the shoe party is the best for this election you say well you see the shoe party is the best and the shoe party says this and gives these reasons so the shoe party is the best it's not going to be very convincing to them because they'd already have to have a commitment to the thing you're trying to convince them of so i think in the sort of tradition that a lot of um Christian philosophers kind of sit in. I'd want to reason from features of the world um, to show why theism is a better account for reality and the various facets of it, right, than some other competing theory. So there are various kind of ways that 
you might go about doing that. But the point is that the premises that you're going to be using are going to be commitments that the person that you're engaging with already has, like features of the world. Because if they're not committed to them, then there's just there's just kind of no point. You're just talking past them, you know. You're just going to say, well, the shoe part, like the shoe party, the best shoe party is going to win. But but like they're like, I don't even know what the shoe party is or what you're talking about. Like, um, you know, we need to actually be like, oh well, we but you know, like, what can we both agree on? Well, we both agree that um, shooting people is bad or something, or we both agree that there's this problem that needs fixing, or there's this feature of reality that exists. And then we can talk about, well, what are theories behind that thing? And then we can compare these theories, right? So, which is pretty standard practice. And we go, well, what are the various commitments of the theories? You know, what kind of entities do we have to have to get them to work? How do they cohere with our other like background beliefs about the world? Because if one theory like requires us to overhaul like every other belief that we have and another theory like maybe just means revising one or two, then that's going to be a far better theory. It's, it's less like epistemically risky with less chance that we're making less mistakes. So I think just engaging in those norms of rational discourse and trying to reason with people that way, even if even if you're the um, position you're arguing from, right, says that you've got some special way of getting to truth or something, because the other person isn't committed to that, is it just not going to be convincing in any sense to say well look i've got special access to the judges and they just told me it's true like that's that's not going to convince anyone yeah i mean um i can only speak honestly from my commitments so then if you're not interested in me speaking honestly from my commitments then i can let other people speak that's fine um well, I, 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 do, I do think that it actually is possible to keep moving forward because there is a good case made right here in Romans. But um, so uh, well, what, what were the premises of the arguments? Right. So the premise was that God's made it known to everyone in their heart. Right. Um, well, it's worded pretty clearly here. Um, what, what kind of entities in, are needed for the theory that God makes it known to people in the heart? What would be a necessary precondition for that theory to be? Well, true? it's obvious. So what, I think what you don't understand about this discussion is it's like if it's daylight outside and I'm standing with someone in daylight and they want me to use a logical syllogistic proof that it's daytime then that's an unreasonable request. And so it says right here in the text that um, well, I think you because can have a good that which may still. be known of God is obvious in them. So it is obvious in you. So well, that's um, just the point that, that part's already about. done. That's not going to be convincing, is it? I mean, it, because... It, well, like, well, it is to best, all who are of the truth. At that point, the best you can do at that point is say... Well, I actually, you can like gaslight the, your opponent, which again is, a, I don't think a good way of debating to say, I know what you think and believe and feel better than you do, right? And you're wrong. Here's what you actually think and feel. But that's not going to be convincing to some, someone who's genuinely convinced that they don't hold that belief. They're going to say, well, now I'm even more convinced that you're wrong because I have direct access to my unconscious experience and beliefs and things. Uh, Nathan, do you do you want to discuss whether or not it's obvious in you or are you not interested in that discussion? Because yeah, it's like, I, I, have, I don't have anything else to offer. I said the only answer I have to this question is the answer which God offers. Sure, okay. but I, I am also entitled, right, to say when I think that you're not giving me good reasons to like believe something. Because if I'm not, if I don't hold that belief genuinely, right, so if, if I like sort of examine my mental state and I think like, is God exists just kind of impressing on me in a self-evident way? And I honestly report that no is the answer. There's nothing more I can do at that point. And you just tell well, me that. Well, that was why I clarified the category too. Because if you understand the category properly, then it makes a lot more sense that if someone believes in a reality or in a truth, they believe in a God. So it's obvious in them that there is a God. Well, well, not if truth and reality are separate to God, though, right? So if they were identical, if you're saying they were identical, then it would be impossible to know truth and reality without knowing God, because by virtue of knowing one, you'd know the other. It's sort of like like the morning and the evening star are the same thing. So if you know the morning star, you know the evening star. You know the evening star, 
you know, the morning star, they're the same object. But your theory is that they're actually different objects. So I don't see how there's a logical contradiction between someone saying that they know reality, right, but they don't know God, even on the theory that God exists. I, I, I mean, and if you think that that is the case, then you're going to have to provide me with what your reason is for thinking that's the case, right, and tell me why I should adopt it. And again, that these are the norms of rational discourse. You can't just assume yeah, your position. It, well, it's, it's actually just a semantic convention. So there's nothing more to it than that. It's just the, the nature of the semantic convention, right? What, I'd like what, to say a couple of things. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That, that God is truth and reality is a matter of trueness. So when William Lane Craig says that truth isn't an abstract object that exists in God, but truth is just whatever is the case, you disagree with him, right? Yeah, I worry for William Lane Craig's soul, generally speaking, so I'm not really interested in arguing based on his terms. Um, I, I'm, not necessarily, I'm not saying he's saying, well, just because for audience, because, you know, I just said something about a brother, I need to address it real quick. I'm not saying he's not saved or something, but he is very much in philosophy and less faith oriented, and I concern for him. So I'm very different from him. Yeah. Well, he, to be fair, he does say that it's the, he knows Christianity is true by the Holy Spirit. And even and it actually all of the evidence is superfluous and doesn't do anything to convince him. But um, I mean, I think basically, I mean, if so, if someone's saying, "Here's my different story about what truth is," okay, and we can talk about how plausible each of these theories is, right? So my theory is that to say that something is true just means that it is the case. So I can express a sentence like, um, "There's pillows on the sofa." And that is true just in virtue of there being pillows on the sofa, right? So that's the, the explanation comes to an end there of how is that true? And there's no God involved. Now, your theory at some point involves God. God is truth. God participates in the the pillow being on the sofa somehow, but he isn't the same. I mean, you're going to have to provide a theory and touch, show me why that theory is better, because otherwise I'm going to go with that other theory, which doesn't involve God and seems far superior so far. Oh uh, yeah, well we have uh, like, let me see how many pages. Well, sometimes it's well over a thousand pages, depending on the size of the type and stuff, you know. So we have the Bible, and um, yeah, it would take many hours to actually go through the argument. It's all like, you know, um, the um, relevance of God relating to us is like a lifelong kind of thing. So it's not it's not something I can sum up very well shortly. I can't convince you in short time or make a syllogism, but um, I can participate in conversations over months and years um, if you contemplate things in a, a, you know, over months and years, the preaching of the gospel may save you under the truth, you know? Um, nothing else can save you, you except, the, pro except the proclaiming of the gospel. So if, you, if the proclaiming of the gospel is something you have no response to, then there's nothing that can bring you to truth. That's the only thing. So if you want to do it your way, that's a problem a lot of people have. They want to do it their way, but God has offered his way, which is the only way. And so I wish three, I could be more flexible with you. But I'll I can't... forget one of them if, if, if we introduce more. Um, so one of the reasons you gave me, right, was that you've got a book, right? So I can also say... So I, I will just to quote quote right I write back at you I've got a book like Elliot Sober. Well, has that, that was my reason book. that I can't give a short answer because it's actually a lengthy answer right. you know. But the the second re the second reason that you gave me was if we did have long enough then I'd convince you right and again I can just say the same right if we had long enough I'd convince you. Well, I you would only be convinced of the truth if you are of the truth and hear his voice if you're a sheep. Um, right. And, it, then, it, and then it, his third reason was this kind of like moral ad hominem, right, which was just to say, well, you can't form true beliefs because there's something like wrong in you. And I like and again, I can just say the same thing back. Right. The reason you're not understanding my position is because there's just something wrong with your ability to form true beliefs. Right. But but can you see how all three of those reasons aren't actually convincing at all? Where, like when the shoe's on the other foot. Um, no, the shoe has been on the other foot, and Jesus makes God obvious, and that eventually drew me 
to Jesus. I mean, it was a long, painful process because deception hindered it. But um, yeah, I've been through the process, so I know it is convincing. So no, I don't see how it's not convincing. I well, what, what were the reasons that convinced you? I, I couldn't understand either of you. Oh, I was just saying, I think Rebecca wanted to, to say something real quick. Well, I do, but now I like this question. So, and it's something someone in the chat asked too. Nicholas, what convinced you of the truth? Like, how did you get to that process? But I do want to say something because I like have an agreement with both of you, but also a disagree. Okay, I mean, I can give the shortest breakdown is that when I discovered the world was really deceptive and was not what I was taught, the only wise person that existed that exists is Jesus. And I remembered the things that he said in his parables. And it was beyond any other supposed wise person or intellectual or whatever. So I had nowhere else to turn um, if I had any seeking of truth. So with nowhere else to turn, um, I um, had a less than saving trust in Jesus, we could say. God was drawing me to him by the truth and by his spirit because Jesus made God obvious through um, his character. That cannot be for forged as in a forgery. That cannot be forged. So then um, eventually a moment came where I trusted the promise of eternal life and instantly I was no longer a victim of deception and my mind was suddenly flowing freely. So then for about three weeks, I felt like um, that character um, from Phenomenon that John Travolta played um, except instead of it getting more drastic, it got less drastic. So I had a lot of silly thoughts, but my honesty was suddenly flowing freely, which was very overwhelming. It's a completely different state of mind. Um, I'm still in that state of mind, but now it feels normal. And since then, um, well, I purged off culture because I noticed that I didn't actually value culture or anything. So then I couldn't, I had nothing I could do with my time. So I had to like research teachings and teachers and research the Bible or else I would just be bored. And so um, because I was looking into the truth through God's word, God was gracious enough and, you know, um, my trust and my learning has progressed since then, according to how the scriptures describes it. Can I describe that back to you to see how much I got then? And you can tell me if, if it's right or wrong. Sure. So um, I think you were sort of having a, a rough kind of time of, of things. And then you sort of turned to various things. And then you started turning to Christianity and God mm -hmm. made well, it. May. Yeah. I think we just got a little lost at the beginning because um, it was that I noticed that the world was like untrue and all of that. So it was a matter of truthfulness and factuality and observation and awareness because um, my hard times actually came later and they were part of the process to break me so that I was open to trusting God later. But that was years later. So the beginning point wasn't um, anything to do with me having a hard time or anything. I actually life was pretty awesome at that point it was just awareness of rea of what was around me and, and then when you started reading the bible um you said jesus made himself known to you in like a a sort of i, I don't think you use the word self-authenticating but i think that's what you're getting at self-authenticating way is that well the character of who jesus is is beyond anything human so it's not a potential human forgery um which explains why i found it so compelling even though i'm an absolute skeptic because that's part of it too is that without skepticism i never would have come to jesus because i would still be deceived by the world so the fact that i'm such a skeptic is why only god was able to overcome that skepticism um yeah, so that's actually, for the way that I came to him, that's an extremely key portion of it, is the skepticism. So, so you were very, very skeptical, but then you started reading the Bible um, 
and Jesus made himself known to you in a self-authenticating way. Well, no, I remembered the Bible from my past, the parables, just um, how truthful they were. And so um, I went back to it, but um, I didn't want to give up my sin. So it was probably about seven years there. Um, no, no, it totaled about a decade. It was just about seven years be before my life totally broke down. And then a few more years before I came to Jesus. So, um, yeah, so generally, yes, just as we're in details, we keep getting details wrong is all. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I'm, I'm wondering then, so if you were talking to a Mormon who said, you know, I, I was very skeptical, but then some Mormon missionaries turned up at my door and they came in and they told me to just pray over the Book of Mormon. And if it was true, God would give me a, a, a feeling that it was true. He'd reveal it to me. Um, so then the Mormons praying, they've got a burning in the bosom. Uh, they say, this is why I believe Mormonism is true. Do you think that that would be something that would convince you that they have formed a true belief? No. And um, the feelings can be very dangerous. So um, this actually goes to um, generally what I want to say. So I'll put a note for myself in private chat about warnings, just so I might remember to bring it up later. But yeah, that... Um, that sudden spiritual experience, um, people go through what feels the same. It's called ego death. Um, that wasn't actually the moment of my breakdown of ego, but because my ego was dead, that was a part of the whole thing. Um, I say ego being dead, kind of colloquially, I'm referring to that term ego death. But um, yeah, people go through these spiritual experiences, and if they don't trust Christ, um, it's actually incredibly dangerous rather than beneficial. And so um, trust in Christ is really the thing. So you, you have to check scripture and be honest and be corrected by God who corrects us through his word. So it's more a process of real learning and real truth stuff like you guys would relate to and how you guys like to relate to truth, you know? It's a real thing like that. So the idea of like um, doing divination of feeling something with your hand over a book or something, um, that's actually commanded against in scripture. And we're actually told to test all things, test all spirits, all sorts of testing and examining is actually the process that God tells us to do. So do you think, um... If the Mormon said, because Mormons do believe in, in Jesus, right? So if the Mormon, and many Mormons would say this, that they prayed and Jesus actually revealed it to them, that Mormonism is true, would that be something that would convince you that they'd formed a true belief? Um, no, I'm not to be convinced by someone else's experience because that would be, I have to know whether or not I can trust them and I don't really know whether or not I can trust them. I, I do want to mention, I was just answering the question as to um, what the process was or whatever. So I'm, I'm not thinking that the process somehow is a convincing case, um, just for the record there. But so, so someone can believe that they have a self-authenticating experience of a God, but actually have a false belief. Is that right? Yeah, and um, the Bible does a lot to warn us against that and to explain the boundaries of that. So the shepherd has his way of keeping us safe from that. And, um, yeah. Well, so, I mean, this is the thing about that, and I'll, I want to say some stuff about what you guys were talking about earlier, too. But, you know, there are many people in the world who are seeking the truth and who believe, and I'm not going to go with Mormonism because that is mixed up with Jesus and the Bible because they do, you know, so I'd rather go with, you know, what, you know, a billion or more than a billion, almost 2 billion people in the world believe, which is the Quran. And so, you know, there are people who believe in the creator God and they believe that the Quran is the true revelation of God. And they believe that the Quran is the perfect book. 
And so how would they know, um, you know, and I'm kind of asking a rhetorical question because, you know, I do think the world is that we, like, we can read the Bible and say, yeah, we know the Bible is true because we, we read it and we, God revealed the truth to us, but there, there are just as many people who are reading the Quran and saying that. So how do we sort out which is the true revelation? And I think that's kind of like a different, um, I mean, it, it kind of got off the topic that we were talking about earlier that I wanted to talk about, but I mean, it is a worthy discussion. Um, you know, how do we know what is the true revelation of God and, and how do we convince others that it is the true revelation of God? And, but like what you guys were talking about earlier with the Romans, you know, that the obvious God's nature is obvious, that God is obvious. Um, for many people in the world, and I've talked to them and I believe their experience, God is not obvious. But the question is why? And I think this kind of like, so I'm kind of agreeing with Nathan that God is not obvious to a lot of people and that we can't convince them he's obvious by, you know, quoting Revelation. But I agree with Nicholas in that if they don't, um, believe the revelation, like if they don't hear the truth and believe it, then that's not something that we, I mean, I don't really find it effective to like go into a deep philosophical conversation about it. I mean, maybe it is, it's probably effective for people like Nathan who study philosophy, maybe it is effective, but, um, like for me, if, if God's nature. And I'm just talking about God. I'm not talking about which God, like which God is obvious. Is it the God that the Quran describes or is it the God of the Bible? But I do think the creator is obvious. And if the creator is not obvious to someone that it's because of what it does say in Romans, that they are suppressing the truth. It's actually, they are in some way without, they might say, oh, I'm not suppressing the truth. I want to know the truth. But in some way, they are suppressing the truth. There is some part of them that does not want to know the truth. And for someone like that, I'm not sure that I can help them except to reveal through my actions and my life the love of Christ and allow them to see um, and or or the revelation of Christ, you know, if it in some way can share you know, the, the words of Christ or the, you know, um, somehow communicate the character of who God is, it may break through that, but like the, it's the work has to be done in the heart and not necessarily by a, um, you know, like a logical or philosophical argument, but I'm interested to know if Nathan, if, you feel like we should have a different starting point. Do, have you found that having a different start point is effective? Um, I said, I think there's so much going on that mm -hmm. it's very, very difficult for me to like tell, tell people how to do it. Like, uh, you know, like it, it's difficult even to step out into the meta of a conversation that I'm in and kind of like, yeah, okay. because for me to critique like Nicholas's presentation, right? Well, while, while Nicholas is kind of there, it's it's sort of a bit weird because I'd have to like offer like what I what I think is going on with some of the reasons why he's giving the reasons he's giving and stuff. But um, I mean, I I think that the philosophy stuff can really backfire as well because I do think that there's like an an ethical thing behind thinking things through with people and it becomes very very hard with a belief that you understand some like intellectual reasons for not to sort of weaponize those reasons and so it becomes very difficult to then try and just explore topics with people rather than try and like battle things with people and so I think I think even for um Christians who are convinced of the intellectual reasons the best way to try and share those reasons with people would be not to um, try and like debate someone 
but to just explore ideas with them and ask questions and see where those things go. And if they go in the direction of like theism, great. But if people just don't come to those conclusions, then that's like also should be an acceptable option. Uh, I also agree with what you're saying. I think that being a, a good person ethically and morally um, is going to be really valuable for helping people that we form relationships with to sort of change their raft of beliefs. Um, I don't think it's exclusively one or the other, because I think you're always going to, when it comes to like discussing propositions about the way the world is, there's always going to be a sort of structure to a belief system that can be, you know, like if we're talking about beliefs that can be true or false, there's going to be some propositions and they can be true or they can be false. Right. But um, so I think you're, you're going to be offering them at some level and we ought to make the best attempt that we can to try and make sure that that's, you know, like coherent and conforms to various like theoretical virtues and things. And I think the kind of virtues that are involved in, trying to form that set of beliefs as well mean that we've always got to be open to being wrong even of our like deeply uh almost deeply held beliefs that we're the most convicted of being true we've got to just be willing we've got to not be so attached to them that we feel kind of icky about the idea of someone disproving that we're right we're just going to be like well yeah if it turns out that way because i w just want to have the truth just want to have the true beliefs um and it, yeah i think and I think it, like Josh Rasmussen, who's a Christian apologist, he does a great job, job I think, of um, doing that in conversations with people, even where, you know, he'll come to conclusions that people disagree with. But he's he's a very good, like, role model uh, engaging in those conversations with people where it's just like, well, let's explore this idea, right? And if people come to a different conclusion than him, he's not going to be like, well, you're rationally compelled to reach the same conclusion as me. Because, I mean, he, he's a, he knows enough to know that there are like other alternative things available for people to take and stuff as well. Um, if I may respond to just one detailed point, because <clears throat> um, like, um, you know, the belief that two plus two is equal to four. I mean, I have, um, I would say an absolute comprehension of the abstraction. So in some sense, I'm not really open to any other idea even though i i could be open to some other idea if there actually is reason but that doesn't actually exist as far as i know and um i know that jesus is the savior with uh, much more assurity than i know that two plus two equals four and so um i think that's the difference is it's a matter of knowledge of knowing it's not a matter of opinion or thinking it's, it's beyond that some things are proven so they're known and um yeah so that does put the christian in a position where it would be dishonest to pretend that there's some opening for jesus to not be the savior because um we're made into new creations that have the truth in us it would be dishonest to pretend we don't have the truth in us. I think the problem with deploying that in a disagreement with someone is that appealing to the fact that you think that your belief is knowledge and so can't be false, right, isn't, isn't going to be something that's going to be convincing to someone else. Because presumably we both accept the fact that there are people who think that they know things but in fact don't think things right and the fact that there's disagreement over the proposition that we're discussing means that presumably we we think that the person that we disagree with if they're going to claim that they know the proposition is just mistaken so it uh, okay for you that might be a convincing reason um but i'm not sure it is for anyone else and that, and then even on on that point of how i mean we might agree that someone can't know something and it be false but our own assessment of the things that we know or don't know might be um, we, we might be able to kind of tell a story there about how we can actually doubt things that we might think we know. So, you know, I, I usually go for like famous examples from physics and mathematics that have been disproven because most people tend to believe them like that all triangles have 180 degrees always and everywhere. Um, I generally ask people if they think that's true or false. They generally say it's true. 
And then you tell them about triangles on a curved surface having an um, interior angle on the, on the concave side, having angles that add up to less than 180 on the convex side, of ha having angles that add up to more. And there'll well, be this that, that's that, a redefinition of a triangle, though. That's expanding it, no, the no, definition a of a triangle. No, it, it isn't. It's a triangle. <laughs> It's just rejecting Euclid's fifth postulate, right? Which is that lines um, that that there's only w one line parallel to any other line. Like it's ju it's just you're not operating on a flat surface anymore. It, that's not not a it, it doesn't become not a triangle because well, the definition but also of a, triangle... a line is the shortest distance between two points. But if it's curved, it's no longer the shortest distance. Well, the the line would be, but the cur I mean, I mean, the curved surface would be different. But that yeah, that I is mean, this is why it's a difference of definition. Once the surface is curved, it's no longer a line. It's no longer the shortest well, distance no, between no, the no. two points. No, because so we're, we're, that doesn't change we can the get definition. Get into other triangle. conventions, but within the same convention, the same thing is still true. Well, right, I think so within the Euclidean geometry, is... right? Sorry. But the, the 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 problem is that if we if we were going to discuss. If we were going to discuss that, the question is about triangles, right? And presumably, someone didn't know about Riemannian geometry prior to the conversation, right? And then as we as we begin the conversation, they realize, oh, actually, as I become aware of more and more reasons, there's actually different cases to what there's something that we agree to being a triangle because it has three sides, um, that the field of geometry has agreed is a triangle because it has three sides, but actually it has different properties to something that we thought we knew beforehand i mean um i'm trying to think of good there, there's plenty of um really good examples but i'm not i i, I memorized a load of them a while back because there's quite a lot in a book called making up the mind by a neuroscientist called chris frith but they're basically just lots of ways that we form like false beliefs that we think are knowledge and then once you're kind of aware of so some other relevant detail you you realize it's an illusion and then the, the point of this being to sort of raise a, a skepticism about the beliefs that we might take to be knowledge not like not a radical skepticism but i think an appropriate skepticism in the face of the direction that human discovery has gone because a lot of these things like um uh, newtonian physics absolute space time and so forth that are things that people have taken to be very, very certain at certain points in time, and then have been later shown to just be empirically false, completely wrong. And I, I don't think that I'm, you know, like less prone to biases than can accept by virtue of the fact that, um, you know, like there's more psychological research on cognitive biases and heuristics that I can be aware of now, and I can I can just lower my confidence in those claims. Yeah, I think. Completely wrong is an exaggeration, and I think that's relevant because the thing that is still true is still true, and I think that's what people were more certain of about, say, Newtonian physics and things. It's not like Newtonian physics doesn't exist and those truths are not truth. It's um, the nuances. Well, it's not true. that Like, like if... Um... You know, there just isn't absolute space time if Einstein's uh, and, and Einstein's theory is the most empirically confirmed theory that there is in physics, I think. Right? Yeah, I'm yeah. not I'm not sure when most people intuitively think Newtonian physics is true. They're thinking that there is absolute space time. I think they're thinking more of the stuff that actually is true about Newtonian physics, if I'm just being honest. Well, what, what about the Earth being flat? Do you think that that is intuitive? Um, I don't think it's intuitive. Um, now, I don't have many opportunities to observe flat areas, so maybe I'm wrong, but I do think if the Earth was... Um, well, the, the Earth being flat... Because we have... We, well, if I can finish saying what I'm saying real quick, please. Um, yeah, because we have... We can level our heads. We have the fluid in our ears to level our heads. And I think um, the horizon would be exactly level if the Earth was flat, but I really don't think the horizon is exactly level. So I think that relates to our spatial intuition, and it doesn't look flat to a person. So I don't think it's intuitive that the Earth is flat, but I don't live in Kansas or anything, so maybe I'm mistaken. Well, I think yeah. it's very intuitive that the Earth's flat. I mean, I, I probably just assumed it was flat until I learned, um, like, some of the basics of what like planets are and stuff from an encyclopedia and all human cultures, right? 
throughout history have also thought that the earth was flat up until well uh, up until people started doing empirical investigations i mean there's a few random greek mathematicians who did calculations uh, about shadows at various points and things to figure out that the earth was a sphere but this wasn't by and large wasn't the belief system that people held i mean just read the the old testament throughout it's a flat earth because it caused monology right um, no it's not it is i mean e even up to up that... the medieval period right even if, if you you can go to hereford cathedral where there's the map of mundi which was written based off of Augustine's City of God by by monks who were trying to construct what the world looks like, okay? And that's a flat earth that, like, people well, believe... The Old that Testament the does not have a flat earth, though. Um, it does. It's a flat earth. If you can show me evidence that, like, pillars of the earth shake because they're pillars that are on the earth, just like cities of the earth shake in an the earthquake. Pillars underneath the earth are the foundations underneath with well, the firmament. that's not... That's, there, there is an instance where um, there's talk about the earth being put into foundations and things like that. And then there's other instances of pillars on the earth that are not related to that. But um, there's nothing where God is trying to describe a flat earth on top of pillars. That just doesn't exist in the Bible. Um, the firmament, the sky that separates the salt water above and below. Which the is firmament again, means, again, the firmament means expanse. Why... I will admit that I don't know what the waters above are exactly and, and, so and here's another that. reason why any other reading is completely anachronistic right because we have other ancient near eastern cultures against which to compare the the texts that are in the bible as well that are written by surround well the whole, similar. the whole purpose of the bible um the old testament it set apart israel from the people around them so right, it doesn't make it, it, it doesn't make it, certain respect, it you're you're assuming the bible has is, no family resemblance between it's the kind of stories is just completely anachronistic and out of out of touch with all Old Testament scholarship. I mean, if we look at like the epics of Gilgamesh, like like we've got like flood flood myths and things like that, we know well, about. Um, if you want, we can do a live stream sometime where we actually go into this because you're making a lot of false claims. What's and I, 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 I would like the time. To, right? I would any, like the time to actually address it or to not discuss it. Any undergrad biblical studies textbooks will say this. So oh, you're, yeah, you're those the ones books are stupid. Scholarship, right? I, I mean, I think I can I can also give you reasons as to why this is the best theory. But not only like not only that, but you're out of touch with what the relevant experts actually say about the field. Well, I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm out of touch. It's that I also look further into the data and I've assessed it myself. It's that I'm much more in touch than you are. Is the, actually the difference? Um, okay, guys, can we get like, I think the flat earth thing is kind of a tangent, but I want to say this, that like, Nathan, what I appreciate about what you're saying and what I appreciate about your statement of faith um, that you put on your blog is that you started with, I don't know this, I don't know this, I don't know this, but I believe this. And so... Um, you know, you like kind of like made a distinction between an absolute knowledge and your own personal beliefs about something. And so I think that's a fair, you know, way of like understanding, like of being open and being humble about, you know, our, our perception of the world. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, look, I, I I find it very difficult, though, to like honestly try and figure out the way the world is, and it because it beca like it becomes increasingly difficult, I think, to try and deal with Christian ideas when I persistently sort of find myself dealing with ideas that are like clearly just motivated and ad hoc and out of touch with i mean the, like the more and more you learn about old testament scholarship the more and more clear it becomes that monotheism is emerging throughout that the that individual books aren't like authored by the people that they say they're authored by that they're composed over multiple kind of years that there's various different models of god going on um that initially in fact it's it's relatively polytheistic and then you don't get um like monotheism emerging until really 
um, the second part of Isaiah, and then there's various reasons and explanations for why that's happening. And I think if you if you want to honestly construct, um, you know, a theory of Christianity, it's got to it's got to work with all that stuff, right? And be like, well, if if a god exists, how could it actually be working through history with these cultures and producing these texts? And how can that make sense? Um, I find it very hard when people begin to sort of like reject all this stuff and go go with um i, I don't know that I, I just think a lot of these other theories really fall apart under even tiny amount of scrutiny you've got to start postulating all these like random random kind of things that i don't think there's any good reason to aside from being committed to a particular conclusion may i read two quick lines of scripture from deuteronomy chapter four sure says, Hear, O Israel, Yehovah our God is one Yehovah, and you shall love Yehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. How does that, like, I mean, um, thank you for reading that. So, um, and Nathan, how does that mesh with what you're saying about it started out polytheistic? Like, how do you understand that? Well, I understand there's straight, what you see, I think, is monotheism emerging over time. I think it's initially what, what would be called henotheism, which is where there's there's one God who's sort of like a, what well, I think Yahweh is a desert God, basically, who's kind of like a big, a big Zeus initially. And in, in the I'm talking about their conception, really. And, you know, he, yeah. he, and okay don't like believe me but like talk to you know people like michael heiser or whatever and basically the idea is that that there are other gods and or, and demons and things and stuff like that and those are who uh, you know other cultures worship the other gods and this is very yeah. similar to another fr from around a similar time that that culture would have been writing you know the idea of marduk who's the one who becomes like king of the gods by battling the other gods and uh, they sort of agree to let let him lead them it's not it's not exactly analogous but there's a sort of precedent for it in it in, in other cultural stories also as late as isaiah i think it, it's somewhere like isaiah 52 or 54 where it talks about yahweh battling rahab the sea monster and cutting up the sea monster and creating reality out of the remains i mean as, as late in the day as that i mean that this is clearly poly, like what a polytheistic creation myth about um about again the the battle between tiamat and marduk where marduk cuts up tiamat and creates the world out of the blood and it and it's like um it's like someone making you know like a a, a cultural reference to something that would kind of be around in the language and i think it's at that time though where you see the that i think in the book of isaiah throughout that's where you see the radical like monotheistic idea emerging and the reason is is because they um they they basically i forget i forget what the word is uh, under, under occupation is the word i'm looking for they they're under occupation and a lot of their kind of religious symbols and things have been you know smashed and destroyed and so forth and the point is to reassert i, I think that you see this psychological shift in the theology where it goes away from well Yahweh's like this guy who's like going to battle the other nations' gods and stuff, and it reconceptualizes him as like this the highest god who's like really like over and above. He's different. He's not like other objects in the world. And then, but even that isn't quite what I think we think of by God. And I don't think we really get to that until the later kind of Hellenization and the influence of Hellenistic philosophy on Jewish thought um, and especially some of the ideas that are knocking around in the New Testament, that, uh, they definitely come through influences from Hellenistic schools of philosophy and so forth, but, um, particularly in the Gospel of John, but also in Paul's writings quite prolifically as well. Um, and, and as he's constructing his, his theology, I think that those um, Hellenistic influences have a big influence. I mean, even when we look to concepts of hell and stuff, when, when things like Tartarus are being referenced and so forth, that... that the Bible isn't, I, I agree that it's distinct from it. I mean, like you don't look to a different culture and get like Christianity or get Judaism. That's because they're not, but it shares a family resemblance because it's embedded in history, right? It's, it, it's written by multiple authors who are in very different cultures, have ve think very different things about reality and it bears the mark of all that. 
Well, I think part of the issue here, like, is that, I mean, I think it's still true that there are other gods. There are other, and I, and I don't think that anything in the Bible denies the reality of other powers that are worshiped as gods. And it, 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 so even, you know, throughout the old Testament and the new Testament, you've got people who are worshiping gods and it's never like, Oh, those, you know, those things actually don't exist. No, it's saying don't uh, like, you know, we don't worship food sacrificed to idols because you don't want to be partakers with demons. And so, you know, in Ephesians, it talks about we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. So I think there is an acknowledgement that there are beings that are worshiped as gods and they do have real power. They actually do have power in this world. There's a reason people worship them. And I think it's kind of, you know, um, I don't know, maybe condescending to think of like people who worship idols as, oh, that's just silly nonsense. They just, they're, you know, that that's actually dismissing um, their experience of the world, which is they have um, experienced power through worshiping those idols. They, they have experienced those powers doing something for them. I'm not saying they should be worshiping them. I'm just saying, you know, because, you know, like the God, the creator God is the one who is revealed to us through the Bible as the one that is worthy of our worship. And the reason that you know, even in the Ten Commandments, it says, have no other gods before me is because there are gods that you could put before the creator God. So he's announcing that he is the true one that is worthy of worship. So it's not that these other gods don't exist. They very much exist and they very much still have power in the world today, but they are not worthy of human worship. Um, may I contribute one point real quick, Nathan? Sure. And that and that's that. Head off though in a second, but yeah. Okay. Well, it's just that in Revelation, there's a vision of a dragon in the sky, and Isaiah speaks prophecy, so it's it's um, correlates with visions, right? As far as symbolism and all that. There's a dragon in the sky with seven heads that's cast into the sea. We're told the sea is people, families, tongues, and nations and um, tongues being languages. And um, out of the sea comes a seven-headed leopard, which is the earthly empire that has the spirit of the seven-headed dragon. So we see the same kind of stuff in Isaiah all the way to the very end of the Bible. Um, there, There's no like, you know, it's not really changed. Yeah, I just say, you know, listen to what a Jew has to say about the Old Testament. There's a reason that they would disagree about about a lot of that. Yeah, that reason is called Kabbalah. Um, I believe that's referred to by Jesus as the synagogue of Satan. Crikey. Um, well, I'm going to have to go. I'll see okay. you in a bit, Rebecca, but thanks. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, the other thing that I wanted to mention about, you know, convincing people of the truth, I don't know that, you know, that's our job to convince people of the truth. We tell the truth. And I mean, I've been an evangelist for a long time and I have learned as an evangelist that I cannot convince someone of the truth. I don't try to convince them of the truth. I tell them the truth. And if God is working in them and they are open to God, then they will receive the truth. And so, you know, that's, just where I'm at. And you probably have a gift with that. That's um, very different from mine. So um, I appreciate that Nathan and I were able to have um, what I would describe as a very masculine discussion there, where it was like disagreements were very straightforwardly stated and not, not taken with weakness or anything, but taken with, you know, just calm honesty. It was very good. Cool. So, he, he was awesome. he was kind of hurrying on his way out. There was no chance to like 
thank him or anything. I don't know if he might still be hearing, but you know, I, I want to mention that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you guys. Mine, Ben, you've been here, but you've been quiet. Do you want to say anything about this discussion or do you want to change the topic? Um, well, I've um, just been listening to the conversation um, between, um, I guess, um, Nathan and, um, and um, Nicholas here. Um, um, hmm. I, I, I wasn't listening for the whole time. I, there were some times where I, st where I was kind of distracted, but... Um, okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, are there any other um, topics that um, would... Oh, I have one that I think is um, really on topic with what the show was, Rebecca. Cool. Um, and I didn't, I didn't mean to, um, you know, become the center of that and take it over. But no, um, things so went fine. naturally. Yeah. So that's how, that's how things go. So, um... Well, I don't remember exactly how this ties in with your live stream now that we've had so much discussion, but, okay. um, you know, um, the warnings that God gives us. Um, I mean, it was something specific that you were saying, oh, and like if we sin mm -hmm. and then Satan wants us to doubt that we're saved over it, he wants mm -hmm. to like challenge our trust in Jesus over it. And... Um, you know, I, I, I do think that the biblical warnings are so important, just like, um, you know, we teach children to be careful about the street for their protection. Right. And, um, you know, I, I do find um, occasion of temptation to the very same sins that that's who I was when I was a dead person. Mm -hmm. And if I were to go to that and be that again, then um, that would be because the trust I thought I had in Jesus, I actually had that trust somewhere else. And when I say go to that again, I don't mean to slip into it, but for that to be who I am again. And it wouldn't even be right. that that's who I am again. It would be that I must still be that person, that I'm not a new creation but um, God does this new creation as an ongoing process through things like me noticing the warnings and talking about it now, you know? Um, we are, it's from faith to faith, from trust to trust. Mm. And those who persevere to the end are the ones who um, truly trust Jesus and are truly new creations. But those who don't trust are not them. And, um, well, I think, you know, what one thing can, one passage that can kind of inform our understanding of this is that, um, Ephesians chapter five, where it says you were once darkness. Now you are light in the Lord. Therefore live as children of the light and do not be partakers with them. So, you know, it's a, a strong command to, hey, this is what you were. Now you are light. So live that way. And But it's saying, like, don't be partakers with them, those people who are still in the darkness, because that's not you anymore, right? And so it's still possible as a child of the light to participate in the works of darkness, but, you know, there's many reasons not to do that. You get, you know, you're basically going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy other people's lives, but, and, and it does harden your heart toward God. But the point I was trying to make is that from God's side, there is no rejection from God's side God is pulling for you. God is, you know, sticking closer to you. God is trying to bring you back to walking in the light. So 
but you can, as a child of the light, seriously mess yourself up if you continue to walk in the darkness. And if you know God, you don't want to walk in the darkness. Um, like you said, there has been a change there. You're a new creation. But what happens to some people, and this actually happens to a lot of people. I don't know if it if it's happened to you, Nicholas, because you know everybody's journey is different. But the reason I speak so strongly about this is because there are so many people who, once they become a Christian, they notice their sin like so much. And like they never noticed it before they weren't a Christian, right? They thought, oh, I'm a good person. And like most people who are not Christians think, oh, I'm a good person. But then when you encounter the light, when you encounter the love of Christ and when you encounter his righteousness, suddenly it like shines a light on all the stuff that's still dark about you. And you become hyper aware of the corruption that's still in you, right? So sometimes it's actually the people who are um, most righteous and walking in the light of Christ who are hyper aware of their corruption. And then that causes them to think, oh, you know, I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid that he'll reject me. So it's for those people that I speak strongly um, to assure them that you know, this is God is with you in your struggle. And we have many struggles in the flesh. And, you know, that corruption that you still see in yourself, that is being removed as you're being transformed into the glorious image of Christ. And that's something that that's assured to you that you will be fully sanctified, that Christ, you're being renewed um, in, in being made in his image. So, um, you know, but I'm not saying that there's no consequence to sin. Sin will mess up your life, but it can no longer separate you from the love of Christ. It will, it, but it will like, you know, if you allow yourself to go down that path, you know, then you can end up with some disastrous consequences. Yeah. And you were talking about your friend and drawing closer to them, wanting to help them as an example of God drawing closer to us. Right. And so what I'm also like adding to this is that the warnings and the chastisement and conviction of sin, yes. those are part of God drawing close to us. And um, absolutely. And I'm yeah. warning my friend, I'm telling her, you've got to stop this because this is going to mess up your life if you keep doing that. And so I'm telling her this, you know, but I'm telling her this with no, um, you know, with no intention of rejection, no judgment at all, just trying to help her to, you know, stay in the truth. So, yeah. And, um, I think, you know, there's, um, Romans 7, I really think, does do the very best job of clarifying it. And I like how um, it precedes with chapter 6 and flowing um, into chapter 7. Mm -hmm. That um, our marriage um, to sin and... Um, perhaps it also refers to marriage, to the law of sin and death. Now, now that I'm better at studying the Greek, I should see exactly what it says about the relationship of the law in all of this. But um, that the only separation from being one flesh is death. So um, that's why he's comparing it to marriage, as we were one flesh with sin, sin was who we are. And we have to die with Christ so that we're available to marry Christ and be one flesh with Christ instead. Mm -hmm. And then it says, um, I'm going to get to the part that's directly on our topic. So it should be right about here. Um, Was then that which is good made a death unto me. So this is referring to the law being the source of condemnation unto death. Mm. And he says, um, absolutely not. But instead, sin, 
that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good so by the law um, sin causes death that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful because we know that the law is spiritual that I am carnal sold under sin so I think what's going on here is that it becomes exceeding sinful, so we'll turn away from it. Um, I think that's, what do you think there? Well, I think he's saying, I mean, the conclusion of it, you know, cause he keeps going and he's like, what can I do? Like, I, I don't do what I want to do. What I want to do is what's right. But what I find in me is that sin is working. And he uh, says, oh yeah, we're, we're about to save me. Yeah. And we're about to get there, but oh, so the exceeding sinful, goes back to the who can save me the desperation for christ himself mm -hmm. okay so i think um i don't know if you were deliberately making that exact connection or not i kind of interrupted you but yeah that it, exactly that what is okay. the answer to that exceeding sinfulness in us it's nothing but calling on who can save me from this body of death it is christ so um, you know, Christ is the answer for us. And, and he does save us more than just from the penalty of death. He actually delivers us from its power. The more that we are yielded to him and his, you know, the, the Holy Spirit of God is living in us. And it is by the power of the spirit that we put to death the deeds of the flesh. Exactly. So, because we know that the law is spiritual, but I am, I'm pretty sure this word carnal is fleshly, um, mm -hmm. but I am fleshly sold under sin. For that which I do, I will to not do. For that which I will to do, that I do not do. Mm -hmm. But instead, what I hate, that I do. Mm -hmm. If then I do that which I will to not do, I agree unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Because I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Because to will is present with me, but to perform that which is good, I find not. Because the good that I will, I do not. But the evil which I will not, that I do. Now, if I do that, which I will to not do, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so um, this isn't permission to sin or anything. It's saying exactly what it's saying, that the sin in your flesh is sinning, but it's not you in your identity that's sinning. And this must be taken in context, because obviously, if we're not speaking in this context, we do take ownership of our sin. So it's very specifically the point that's being expressed is the point we want to listen to and be taught as mm -hmm. God intends to teach us. And yeah, so knowing that we're not the sinner means that we'll do that which responds to what we believe, right? Like, um, I believe that it's possible to get into a car accident no matter how well I drive, or I could make a mistake driving, so mm -hmm. I believe it's worth it to wear a seatbelt every time, even though um, I don't know if I've ever benefited from a seatbelt um, significantly, right? <laughs> so um, maybe minorly for extremely minor whiplash or something a couple times, not when I was driving. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, because I actually do believe the seatbelt is worth it, I do wear it. If I actually do believe that I am not the sinner, then I'll actually walk in not sinning. So it's actually important for us to know who we are in Christ and to trust yes. the, to trust what God says about taking away our sins so that we actually step into living that. You know, God... The whole process of salvation, much of it, the way God chooses to do it is through his word, the scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's a matter of when you see sin for what it is, 
it loses, you don't, why would you want to do it? Right? Because God is love and everything that is not from love is sin. So like, why would you want to be unloving? Why would you want to, and, and sometimes like, Sin can be deceptive. So, you know, you have a lust of the flesh that seems like it's so desirable and so um, preferable. Um, but like when you see the reality of it and when you see the consequence of it, then like when you see and experience the love of God and you compare that to what this what sin offers, they don't compare and I think that's part of what happens in a Christian as they grow to know Christ more and more. They like the desire for sinful things actually falls away. And I'm not saying a Christian can never get tripped up and like redeceived. They can. Um, but, you know, the the more that you're abiding in Christ and that you're mind is focused on heavenly things, not earthly things, the harder it is to be deceived by sin. So very true. And um, I know I had a thought for a moment, but then, you know, I was focused on listening, so I let the thought slip away. Okay, well, maybe you'll get it back. Let's see if, mind Ben, do you wanna say anything? Um, I, so, um, yeah, it, it um, I, so, it, hmm, well, scripturally, um, out lately, um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, First John, um, mm -hmm. and, cool. uh, I think it's, um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think I might be dropping out. Okay. It's all right. Oh, no. It, it okay. seems to be going okay. It's Oops. But, um, well, I'll mention first John in context, also the other thing I was going to say. Um, is um, the word sin. Um, I don't know if you know what it means, Rebecca, as far as the exact translation of the word. Like the missing, the mark, the archer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, some of what Mr. Strong says about it, about the etymology is kind of weird. So a bit of his etymological okay. theory, I think, is incorrect. Now, he didn't have the internet, and he was doing the entire of all the Greek words by hand, right? Um, he would have to like travel or have people travel. So he would have resources to study and stuff. It was a whole day. So um, yeah, it's um, not to discredit him, but he didn't necessarily have endless hours to contemplate things. He had a lot of dealing with the process and stuff, but um, it does mean miss the mark. So that is the point. And um, it means that in Hebrew and in Greek, and it's just very clear, uh, miss the mark. Um, I think it, you know, um, it also has a meaning of mistake. And it's interesting that um, it does mean sin, obviously. Um, but God chose not to use a word that is, you broke a rule and Ought to be punished that's not the word he chose to use he chose to say you missed the mark and um it's very much more like um how a father speaks to a child mm -hmm. um both graciously and effectively and all that so um it's a, a gentle word of choice and i think we lose something if we don't hear the gentle word choice because it's the word mm -hmm. sin people just define it as um, breaking God's rule, and you die from that. <laughs> and um, it's unfortunate that we don't hear the way he said it, which was also gentle, 
and brings balance to the whole thing and completeness to the whole thing. So yeah. um, uh, the etymology difference is that Mr. Strong says like you miss a portion or a part and he's thinking like a share in something. And by thinking a share in something, he's like, so maybe because you don't hit the target, you don't get the prize in a contest. But like this word is used in war and stuff, you know, so um, really the part is the part of the entire target that you're supposed to hit the bullseye. Mm -hmm. So that's where the portion comes from. It's the portion of the target. And it does come from a word for um, that also means shape. So it's literally the bullseye is the circle at the center you're supposed to hit. It's a shape and it's a portion of the whole target. So that's where he's mistaken on the ed etymology a little bit. Um, it's not that you don't get a portion, as in you go to hell instead of heaven, um, kind of a thing. I think that's where his mind kind of went, but that's not the actual etymology of the word. Mm. It, and then um, in John, I think it's actually much clearer when he's talking about, well, maybe or maybe not. I kind of have a theory that when he says we cannot miss the mark because God's seed is in us mm -hmm. and he cannot miss, that in that context, we're actually the projectile and it's God who cannot miss the target. Yeah. And so that's why um, it's an assurance of salvation that we cannot yes. miss the mark because God cannot miss. Um, I could be mistaken on that interpretation. It's a theory I have though. And that's, and I'm glad that you brought that up about him like it's, it's him because Jesus, and this is something I don't think that I have said in this stream and that's important, which is that, you know, the Christian life is not about trying. It's about trusting in what Jesus Christ did. Actually, there was an exchange of righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so he is righteous and we are righteous because we have been placed into him. We were crucified with him, the old self, the, the self, anything that you see in yourself that is still corrupt, that is part of the old creation that is dying away as the glory of Christ and, and his image is being revealed in you. So our righteousness does not come from, I did this today, I did that today, and, and so I'm making myself more righteous. No, we are righteous because Jesus hit the mark. Jesus hit the bullseye. Jesus, Jesus is the savior. He is the one who provides for us everything. The, the, the healing of the corruption of this world and the, the power over death. And um, th there's a spot in scripture. I haven't been able to remember where it is. And mm -hmm. I haven't been able to remember the wording well enough in English okay. to find it on the internet like I usually can. Uh -huh. But when I did the Greek word study on it, Jesus is referred to as hitting the mark over the saints. Mm -hmm. And over can be like, don't cry over spilled milk. It can be the purpose. But over can also be like above and beyond. And it might have both applications there word play is not unheard of in scripture mm. so um yeah that he hit the mark over the saints but it's not really translated that way but it's such a clear contrast to sin the way it's actually worded um yeah so i um someday i'll track that down and cool. then i'll be able to cite exactly where it is <laughs> awesome Thank you. Um, so guys, we've been going for a while, so I think it might be time to kind of wrap it up, but I, I still want anybody to share any final thoughts, getting back to like the overarching topic of um, having a true picture of reality. And you can say anything about anything that is like within that, um, you know, how do we wake up to reality? And I'd like to mention momentarily that I was hoping to ask Nathan if he has any familiarity with um, the opening of Corinthians where it talks about the wisdom of this world as mm -hmm. in contrast to the wisdom of God. So um, I'd just like to read two brief portions of scripture. One mm -hmm. will just be um, informed mind of Christ, if that's in here. 
It's not, but um, actually that same point is there in First Corinthians. So I'm gonna, if I may, I'm gonna open that up and um, go th through a decent portion here, but I'll just read through it without commenting. Um, let me see. Okay, so unfortunately, you got to read the part about baptizing people because his transition mm -hmm. involves that. So I'll just start here. Now I beseech yeah. you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all y'all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you. But instead, y'all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Or do you prefer if I screen share it? No, it doesn't matter. I think it's good when you just read it. Okay. Because most people hasn't... are on a phone. They're not going to be able to read the small writing anyway. I, I, I zoom in pretty close, but mm -hmm. that's all good. For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them of Clo, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, that is Peter, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were y'all baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, except Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, because it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Because after that in the wisdom from God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of proclaiming to save them that trust. Because the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Because y'all see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, has God chosen, yeah, and things which are not, to bring to not things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are y'all in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. And let me, if I may look to see how soon it comes to the mind of Christ. Yeah, it's the at the end chapter. of this very short mm -hmm. chapter. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so, and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, because I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling in my speech and my pre proclaiming, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, mm -hmm. that your trust should not stand in the wisdom of men, but instead mm -hmm. in the power of God. Howbeit, 
we speak wisdom among them that are perfected, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to nothing, but instead we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the prin <clears throat> excuse me, which none of the princes of this world knew, because had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Hallelujah. But, in, but instead, God has revealed unto us by his spirit, because the spirit searches everything. Yeah, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. I, I want to take note here. He says the spirit of the world. Sometimes yeah. we think drawing intellectual boundaries is like relevant. It's often not spiritual matters. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. so even so, the things, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us from God, which things mm -hmm. also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges everything. Yet he himself is judged of no man because who has the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. That is beautiful. I love that passage. And it does bring us back to the reality that, you know, we are in Christ and that no mind can know the things that God has prepared for those who love us. And I think that is what I would love to say about reality is that don't get caught up in the mundane things of life. There's nothing mundane about what is happening in this world. You are important. You're a creation of God. You are part of a glorious uh, reality. And you should know that you're loved by God. And, and I want to thank the atheists who have stuck with us this whole time. Um, Zhang and, and I don't know if Benjamin Schooley is still here. But guys, I just I want to thank you for being willing to chat and participate in in so many of my live streams and in, on so many of my videos, I'm, it, it really blesses me that you hang out, even though you have a different perspective. And of course, I do hope one day you will see the reality of God. You will experience the reality of who he is and his love for you. Um, but until that time, I'm just thankful that you're here. Thank you for expressing your opinions. And thank you for those who are responding to them, like Steeny Stuff and just everybody who's in here. Thank you guys for being here. And um, thank you, Nicholas, um, Proclaimer of the Messiah. I love that name. And I love all the thoughts that you've shared here. So. Oh, um, may I share my slogan? Um, sure. Which I, I really mean it every time. Um, uh -huh. it, it sounds like a script, but um, it's a meme, but it's a meme that my heart means every time I say it. And that is just, oh, wait, I'll go ahead and put myself on camera too. Just trust Messiah. Yes. Yes. Amen. Thank you for being here, Mind Ben. And um, so I appreciate you guys. Uh, God bless you. And I want to just say a prayer of blessing. Oh, mine Ben wants to say something. Go ahead. Um, well, um, I, I didn't want to say anything. I just want to say oh, um, thanks for um, opening up the live um, chat and um, have a good day. You too. Thanks for being here. Okay. Well, 
For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and grounded in love will have power together with all the saints to know how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ. May you walk in that love today and may that love be the reality that you experience. May you experience the reality of the glory that is part of your existence. God bless you and Lord, thank you. Amen.